for an organization building a digital arm for centrist and progressive campaigns, pairing um, top notch technical and digital talent with best in class technology. Um, we've done 50 plus projects on campaigns in the last several months. A bunch of people here I know are part of the community, so I recognize them. We've actually worked on campaigns. So uh, actually, raise your hand if you've worked on a campaign. Oh, awesome. So ask them if you haven't. Um, and um, as part of you know building a bridge between tech and politics, we're holding about 12 of these fireside chats between um, tech and political leaders. So today we're really excited, tonight I should say, we're really excited to have um, David Chu and Michi Sakabi with us. Uh, for a quick introduction, Assemblyman David Chu was first elected to the Assembly in 2014 and re-elected in 2016. Um, I believe he's the only member of the Assembly that comes from a tech background. Yeah, I have a Republican colleague. Okay, we have a Democratic member. <laughs> um, and um, amongst other committees, he's the chair of housing and community development and on the budget committee. Uh, Governor Brown has signed 34 bills that David has authored. And um, previously, David was president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Um, so we're thrilled to have him here tonight. Um, Ruchi is an entrepreneur and investor and started her career uh, at Facebook in 2005 as the first female engineer there. Uh, worked on products that you might be familiar with, like the newsfeed, um, which people talk about once in a while these days. <laughs> um, she's also been um, on the executive team at Dropbox um, and is currently the co-founder of South Park Commons, which is a community that brings together entrepreneurs working on early stage ideas. She's also extremely involved in Forward.us, which advocates for immigration reform um, and has been outspoken on several other issues. So this is going to be a fun conversation. I hope to talk the least. Um, so we're excited to talk frankly about tech and politics and the meeting of the two. Um, in case you're unaware, we're also broadcasting on Zoom. Um, and um, that will be available later as well. So hi to everyone that is with us on video. Um, if you have questions that we're not asking, you could probably the easiest way is um, my Twitter handle at jalter. Um, and then I think TFC Fireside Chats is the hashtag raising. Um, but we'll try to maybe take some questions at the end. So just to start things off, um, you know, you both started your career in the private sector, obviously you remain there, um, but have sort of a foot in with Forward on Us and some other initiatives. So I'd love to just really briefly hear from both of you, um, you know, how you started getting more involved in the public slash government sector and why. Um, I'd love to answer the question, but um, maybe we should take a moment um, to acknowledge what Eddie has done for the city. Yes, that's uh, and just have a moment of silence. My uh, first encounter with Mayor Lee was when I was uh, really interested in politics and someone recommended that I should get involved in local politics. So I did actually go down to City Hall, meet with my district supervisors, and met with a lot of other district supervisors about how I could directly get involved um, without you know, standing for elections or being part of the process. It was actually Mayor Lee um, that provided many different avenues um, and paths and made a lot of different introductions. Um, and I'm sure David can say more about him and the impact he's had in San Francisco. But I, for one, thought he was a fabulous mayor. Um, Would you like to say something? About sure. Well, I, I appreciate you mentioning uh, Mayor Lee. In our city today of San Francisco, we, we suffered a tremendous loss with, with his passing. and. Uh, and I would say Mayor Lee was, was someone who really partnered with many of us uh, who have tech backgrounds and who have thought about our region, our city as a possibility for technology and innovation and really helped to, to turbocharge that in, in recent years. And uh, There's a lot that will be said about his uh, tremendous legacy, but, but certainly helping to, to move forward our place as a leader in the innovative economy uh, was one. Um, so to answer the question, um, I became an American citizen, so could actually participate in politics. Um, 
and uh, directly like impact issues that I care about. But the catalyst for me was that um, I was an immigrant and um, there was a lot of conversation and um, immigration became a hot topic. Um, and there were a lot of avenues for me to directly contribute both to the cause and the conversation. And that was the catalyst um, that led me to get more involved because there was a cause that I was really passionate about. And I would say for me, um, I started and, and ran a venture back technology company for almost 10 years before I ran for office. And uh, it was an amazing experience being in that sector. Um, but I saw so often the ways in which government at different levels held back innovation and made job creation difficult. Uh, I was elected in 2009 and proposed a number of changes to, to help figure out how government could better uh, work with our innovative sectors didn't really, we weren't able to move things in 2009, 2010, and then 2011, um, our city, our state, our country was in the depths of the Great Recession. And uh, Mayor Lee had just uh, become mayor. And uh, he and I and, and my colleagues at the Board of Supervisors be trying to tackle a number of these things, including the fact that San Francisco used to be the only city in the state that had a payroll tax on, on businesses. And we were also the only city at the time in the country that thought it was smart to tax uh, the stock options of startups. And when we decided to move beyond that, uh, we created close to 150,000 jobs, uh, really made our mark as, uh, as, as, as a capital of the innovative sectors here in the Bay Area. And uh, the rest is history. Great. Yeah. And thanks for mentioning Mary Lee. So let's let's actually talk about um, immigration a little bit. You both um, have immigrant backgrounds. You're, you are an immigrant. Your parents are immigrant to do it. Um, how do you guys react to the current backlash against both immigrants and, and immigration? And, and how do you think that people that are in states like California can be helpful? So, so I'll start that. You know, I think it's important to note that the immigrant backlash that we read about and hear about represents, and I'll put it in political terms, um, a, a subsection of Trump supporters who are a subsection of our country. So while there's, I think, a perception that somehow a majority of the country hates immigrants, I just don't think that is the case, certainly not here in California. Um, secondly, if you look throughout history, uh, particularly during economic transitions and, and challenging economic times. Uh, immigrants are the first to be scapegoated. Immigrant workers are the ones who are blamed for all ills in society. And it's not a surprise that that is what happened last year with the presidential election. Um, you know, sadly, unfortunately, um, our side, we didn't see how deep the perspective was and how intense it was. Um, but I think it's important for us to, to think of how do we address those root causes that, uh, that, that are the basis for the fear of demonizing and uh, some of the hatred that we've seen in recent years. So I agree with everything David has said, but to add to it, I think um, some of the key issues that swing voters care about is defending sanctuary cities, um, which um, are essentially cities where state governments don't cooperate with every government. Um, they're also afraid of the numbers of immigrants that might come in the future if states were to continue as they do. Um, there's a very strong anti-Muslim bias um, and jobs is another big one that David mentioned. Um, and people saying that it's easier to bring in immigrants than it is to train a career of American workforce. Um, and there are strong data points that disprove all of those um, fears that people have. And it's really important for people to come out with their personal stories, talk about their personal stories. Um, it turns out that immigration actually does create um, jobs. Um, if you look at the Fortune 500 companies, they either created a large percentage is created by immigrants or immigrant parents or like, you know, immigrant grandparents. Um, a large percentage of the tech companies um, between two up under 2012, and this is like a statistic that Berkeley released, was also created by immigrants. 
Um, so immigrants in many ways add to the economy um, and they do create jobs. Um, and there are a ton of statistics that have been published in the past couple of years that prove the point. So I feel it's a twofold thing. I think we can use data um, to make the argument more powerful, but I also think it's really important for people to come um, forward with their personal stories. Uh, because we all know someone who is an immigrant or a child of immigrant parents. Um, so almost everyone can empathize with that personal story. Do you think, I think part of the problem is there is a ton of data. Um, and this is true probably on many topics, so let's stick with immigration. For now. There is a ton of data and um, facts. And either they're um, not getting to the right people or they're being ignored. And part of that is, you know, something that a lot of people talk about right now, which you can call fake news or just like seeing what you want in your news feed. And so, um, you know, that it's not the absence of facts, it's the absence of people believing them. So how do we combat that? And I mean, immigration is just one area where this is an issue. It can be an issue on a myriad of areas. Yes, indeed. I, I know you're the expert on Facebook news. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear about that. Um, I will caveat this by saying I love Facebook a long time ago in 2010. <laughs> um, but, I mean, face, let, let's, let's take Facebook, for example. They made some recent announcements, which I think um, are really positive. They talked about increasing tech down, improving investment in technology to combat exactly the problem that you're talking about, increasing transparency around um, showing you exactly who is advertising and the entire history of advertisements that um, they have published in the past. And I think the key here, or the key word here is actually transparency. Um, I think the more we can, and not just on Facebook, but across all news sources, I think the more we can be transparent about where the information is coming from and who is putting out the information, I think people will tend to believe it more and have more faith in the information itself. Um, you have to believe that, otherwise we're just, I mean, otherwise we're just like roaming around blind and it would in ignorance in some sense. And I would add to that, I think um, social media companies like Facebook have an absolute responsibility at this time to help us figure this out because uh, whether they like it or not, you're a former company, was part of uh, the information sources that led to, to what we saw. You know, one of, uh, I'm an attorney, my background is to be a trial lawyer, and there's an old saying that when the facts are on your side, you pound the facts, and when the law's on your side, you pound the law. And the facts and the law are not on your side, you pound on the table. <laughs> and, and for Donald Trump and for his Republican allies, they have neither the facts or the law. And so they've been screaming at the top of their lungs with the things that they say, and Protecting immigration, uh, whether it be Latinos or murderers and rapists and Muslims or terrorists and the Chinese are stealing everything we have. Um, those are the things that scream on the Facebook feed, and people click on them and they go viral, and people believe. And um, and the social media networks we have have been so incredibly important in connecting us and passing along information, but we've seen the dark side and the downside. And uh, you know that leaders at Facebook and other social media companies are working really hard to figure this out. And from my perspective, we can't happen soon enough. I absolutely agree with you. So I actually have a personal story on this point. Like one of the products that I worked on um, very early on and helped design was Facebook platform. And in some sense, I was, as a team and as a group of technologists working on it, we were extremely naive. We believed the free market economy would work. Um, and anybody who's ever built a Facebook application will tell you what a wrong assumption that was. And the belief was simply that users will choose the good actors because they're good actors and the bad actors will just die out um, because there will be no market for it. Um, and if anybody remembers the days of Facebook.com, there was a ton of spam, a ton, ton of like, you know, um, people throwing pizzas on each other and sign on each other and all this happening in the virtual world and it, it just didn't serve any good. Um, and 
And back then, I used to truly believe that we had to maintain our neutral stance, that this was a free market economy and the good apples would win and the bad apples would die out. And today, I'm coming around more to your point of view, which is that these are such powerful platforms um, that they have to they have to almost take a moral stance now. Like they have to decide what is good, what is bad, how to promote the good, how to promote the bad. And if you look back at history, and these are some of the questions that, like, you know, help me like think about some of these things. When TV first came out, um, network channels were forced to do an hour of news. This is this was not optional. It was regulation. You had to do an hour of news, and the other regulation was that you had to cover both parties. That was also not optional. Um, and you had to give equal coverage and time to both parties. And if you think back, and, and the main reason was that these networks were so influential that they were, um, they were putting out a point of view on like, you know, what is right, what was wrong, what was good for the country, and they were going to do that. They needed to do that in an unbiased fashion. Um, so fast forward to today, um, I don't think uh, you can simply not do anything, especially given like what has happened in the last election and basically say we're going to be a neutral platform. I think, I agree with you. I think they need to invest a lot and they are investing a lot. Um, and I think one of the biggest issues to deal with is that, you know, social good, good for the world, et cetera, may sometimes not be completely aligned, aligned with financial profits. But, you know, people can take a point of view and which marks up what Facebook did and said that, you know, we're making investments that will affect our board user results next year. Um, and I think that they're working and I agree with you that they need to work harder and that this is a real issue that we should all like, keep pressing on. Do you think that the, there should be a very strict policy? Or like there's a decision making framework that leads to an answer? Or do you think that a lot of when to step in on bad actors is a judgment call. Um, I don't think you can start with policy. Um, I, I think that the system has, at least today, um, a lot of signal, a lot of information, um, a lot of, um, like we, we've witnessed the repercussions of like what could potentially go wrong. Um, that there are obvious low hanging fruits um, that we could implement immediately to rectify some of these things. Um, so I, I, I think it needs to be more of an iterative process because I honestly believe that no one has seen this ever happen before. Um, so it was, it's very difficult to come up with policy that would be, uh, that would solve for it in an elegant way was to become the lowest common denominator in some sense that stops innovation. Um, so I think policy can come, but I think more of it needs to be um, iteration over time. And I think the jury's still out. Um, you know, Facebook is such a, a dominant platform um, that when, for example, the algorithm changes, and we know today that posting a video is going to get you a lot more views than posting an article, and it shifts how all of us in our sphere have to intersect. Uh, I think it puts a, a different kind of obligation for, for the company that, that manages that. And uh, if any of you want to be just totally impressed, feel free to visit my Facebook page or any Facebook page of your elected officials. Whenever I post anything up on guns, immigration, LGBT rights, choice, the intensity of the comments uh, would freak out anyone under the age of 17 years old. It's really bad. And what I hate the most about it is I can't always know who my haters are. I try to understand who are these folks that occasionally they are public and they're an individual that I can track and say it's that person who wants to take a gun and do all sorts of things to me because of how I feel about gun control. But in many instances, we just don't know. And, and this is the same type of lack of transparency to your point that led to Russians being able to influence us in an election. So how do we take a step back? How do we ask, work with the Facebooks of the world to take a step back and, and help us ensure that uh, that there is a level playing field. I don't have the answers because I'm on the inside, but I hope you do. <laughs> no pressure. Would you like to remind you to end that there? That's true. That's true. You have a lot of friends there. We'll I talk mean, afterwards. I, I have a response to that, but I can do more. Okay. All right. Okay. We're going to take one question from the audience. It seems like there's a question there. Yeah. I, I'm actually.
curious, um, a lot of this regulatory overlay across the Facebook or Twitter so forth, right now the talk is coming from the federal level. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if the current federal government necessarily has the wherewithal. Either, either ability to get things done, you know, in a gridlock, you know, environment, or necessarily the will. Um, so, I'm curious if there's a role for state or local government to take a role here in the same way that you know they did with marriage equality when it started to happen. Let me just repeat the question. Yeah. So, anyone on video here? But um, the question is basically a lot of the government's toll intervention right now is happening on the federal level, and do they have? Um, either the understanding or the wherewithal to get something done, um, we'll stop. And is there a role then for state government to be helpful the way they were with uh, marriage equality? So, or gun uh, control or, you know, so many other issues which were led by state and local yeah. government. Uh, Jeremy, I think it's a fabulous question. Um, I think, unfortunately, none of us are holding our breath for Washington, D.C. and this Republican Congress and this Republican president to do anything. Right. So it does get left to us. The, the challenges with our state system, oftentimes the tech leaders will tell us, well, David, we understand where you're coming from, but if you innovate this way in California, New York innovates that way, and Delaware innovates in a different way, we're going to have all these standards. So can you just hold your breath for a couple more years and hopefully we'll get back to sanity in a few years? Um, at this point, Many of us who are policymakers from California, we just don't have patience for what's happening when the Trump administration wants to uh, attack net neutrality, when they're rolling back consumer privacy rules, when they're doing all sorts of things that are undermining what I think of as, uh, as basic moral constructs for how we, how we ought to operate. Um, I feel like we have to lead, and, and the state of California, we are the sixth largest economy in the world. So there are a lot of things we think about, but um, but we do hear from uh, the, the, the tech industry, please don't regulate us at the state level, but the feds do it while the feds don't work, and thus nothing happens. It's a real, it's a conundrum we deal with probably on a weekly basis at this point. Um, we're going to take some questions at the end, also. Let, let just. Um, to make sure we cover some other topics, um, which I know this is a Facebook and tech is a hot one, but um, I want to talk a little bit about San Francisco in particular, especially since you were, um, you know, the assemblyman for part of San Francisco and were head of the Board of Supervisors. Um, you called the Republican tax plan, I think the quote is devastating for housing efforts in San Francisco. Um, can you tell the audience briefly why? Uh, sure. That's so. Well, I would say it's devastating for every aspect of how we live today, but specifically around housing, I made that comment as the chair of California's Assembly Housing Committee because buried in the fine print of this bill that most of the Republicans didn't even have a chance to read before they voted on it are provisions that eliminate uh, the ability of, of states and cities like San Francisco to build affordable housing. The, the financing mechanisms, which are very much tied to federal tax law uh, through uh, S-7 terms like private activity bonds and 4% tax credits, this is how affordable housing has been built in, throughout the country. And, uh, and Donald Trump has taken a wrecking ball to that, as he is to so many other aspects of the tax code, which will have an effect, the ability of enriching his billionaire buddies uh, at the expense of everyday folks, middle class folks, uh, lower income folks and at the state of, at the respect, uh, at the, uh, uh, to the detriment of, of California and blue states, including the wealth creators in our city. Um, and I thought it was a politically genius and diabolical way for Republicans in Congress to enrich red states and their, uh, and their dollar friends um, at our expense. And it is going to be devastating to us on many levels, but specifically around housing, what they're estimating, we're going to lose a couple billion dollars a year that we used to invest in building affordable housing. They're estimating over the next 10 years, the state of California will lose the ability to build about a million affordable homes just because a couple of lines of tax code are being made. So that's an example of something that very few people know about, and it was, that was my responsibility to yeah. sound the alarm. Yeah, not a lot of so 
I guess, and this is a question actually that was submitted from before um, when we took questions from the audience. In a city like San Francisco where housing is at a premium and new development is hard um, and, and potentially getting harder, um, what can citizens do to promote not just low income housing, but housing for all? Um, we could spend a whole hour on this, but let me just try to <laughs> encapsulate in two minutes uh, some of what we're thinking and some of what we've done. So we're in the midst of the most intense housing crisis that San Francisco and the Bay Area and our state has ever experienced. In fact, the Bay Area housing crisis is now a statewide crisis. Um, and there are a number of reasons why we're in this crisis, and I am really excited that for the first time our legislature uh, this year uh, passed a package of housing bills signed by the governor in San Francisco a few weeks ago to really start to address a few of these. One is we are starting to reinvest in building affordable housing for the first time in many years, really since the fourth degree recession. Uh, so $5 billion over the next five years, although that can all be wiped out if Donald Trump's tax plan passes. Um, secondly, we've made it really hard to, to build. Um, with a variety of, of laws and regulations, as well as NIMBY folks who just don't want to build much more. And so there are a number of laws that we just passed that help to streamline, make it easier to build housing. And I often say this at every level of affordability. It's not enough to just build low income housing, you've got to build workforce housing, middle class housing, and market rate housing, and you need to turbocharge all of that. And then the third thing I'll mention is there are many cities around the state, particularly in the Bay Area, that are happy not to build. And I, because this is a tech crowd, I'll say it this way, that are happy to bring the new Facebook campus in, the new Apple campus, the new LinkedIn campus, but they say, you know, we're happy to bring five, ten, five, ten thousand new jobs and workers, but we're not going to build any housing. So that all of these workers have to live in what little housing we have in cities like San Francisco and San Jose and Oakland, who are striving mightily to build. Um, we created, it's estimated, anywhere from six to eight jobs for every housing unit we've created. And that, to me, is, is part of this conundrum. And while we have intense tensions between, say, tech workers and others in our dense and crowded communities, a lot of this is, a lot of these issues stem from decisions that are made with these cities that are happy to bring in these campuses. So I'll give one example. We live next to San Francisco, it's right next to the city of Brisbane. There was a, uh, a developer that went to Brisbane and said they wanted to develop commercial development, thousands of new jobs, and they also wanted to build thousands of new units of housing. And the Brisbane City Council, led by its former Brisbane mayor, said, we'll take the jobs, thank you, but our workers can all live in San Francisco. And when you, met, when you multiply that by dozens of cities making micro decisions like that, there's no wonder we're in the crowd. The press is right now. So uh, we need to address all of this, and we need all of you and everyone else to hopefully engage in these comprehensive solutions. I um, want to add to that also because I've been um, in the San Francisco planning um, experience. It took me three years. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> I'm sorry for myself, but it took me three years to get uh, permits to build here in San Francisco. Um, and so I want to address the part of the question that asks, what can we as citizens of San Francisco do to help fix um, this problem? Um, so the thing that strikes me really odd about San Francisco, and I hope the second point that you made, which is I can change the laws actually addresses this, is that every building goes through the public review process. Um, I mean, take LA for example, like, you know, they have these like by right laws and then if you satisfy those laws, they're allowed to build and if you ask variances about those laws then you go into review. But San Francisco, if you want to add a 75 square foot addition to your house or they're trying to approve the central SOMA of zoning plan, it goes through exactly the same review process, which is ridiculous to some degree. Um, and it takes, and today, like if you ask someone, like you know, how long will it take for your plans to even be considered? If the timeline is approximately eight months, eight months before you can get an answer um, from the planning department. And there are really easy ways to change this because the department tries to start strive for consensus. So one thing is that every time there's a hearing in city hall, you'll find a lot of NIMBY people there, but you will never find anyone 
pro-housing, being vocal about why the city needs to be pro-housing. So even if like two or three or four of us showed up randomly like once a month, it would actually change sentiment um, in the planning department um, for the people who are on the board, for the people who are making those kinds of decisions to hear an alternative voice. Um, now, when you speak about affordable housing, I mean, it's great that we're able to raise funds and so on and so forth, but it costs $800,000 to build one unit of affordable housing. That is insane here in San Francisco. Um, and, and, and there are ways you can, like, you know, and there are ways that I guess the government did not do anything about, or policies you can't do anything about, but there are other things that we can fix. Like, you know, there's the CEQA thing, and then there's the building code, and there's the fire code, and there's like all of these other codes that you have to satisfy when building on these units that like keep adding up. Um, and like will lead to like the cost being $800,000 to build one unit of affordable housing. And as a city, we can do something about that. It doesn't need to be that way. Um, so there are like, I mean, I feel, I, I'm, I, as you can tell, I'm very frustrated. I'm intimately aware of the whole planning process. I've been through every phase of it. Um, and I just, I just don't understand uh, why we operate the way we do or how we operate the way we do. The other thing we can do is like just basically hold the planning department a little bit more accountable um, and force them to like answer some of these harder questions. Um, like, why, why, why are some of these things the way they are? Like every time there is an improvement proposed or an improvement put out, like they actually are the ones that are fighting it most of the times. Um, and, and, and when I say improvement, I mean an improvement in the process that might accelerate some of these things or like make some of these things easier, which might make it in a which, you know, where you don't need like public review for everything, you don't need consensus for everything, which will like make things a little bit more efficient, but they're constantly fighting that change also. So I feel like we can, we also have a responsibility to hold them accountable um, for what is holding back, um, increasing the number of housing across the spectrum that are affordable or not. Is the stuff that you mentioned going slowly? So, you know, I'll say, I'll say a few things. Um, you definitely represent a perspective that we hear about all the time. And, and I am of the, perspective that we need to have some level of process for the community to be able to dictate how we grow and how we build. But to your point, I completely agree with you that oftentimes that process is abused. There are bureaucracies that add years to projects uh, that cost time and money and cost projects to buy. And it is too easy for a small group of, uh, of, uh, of, of neighbors that just don't want to see change to block housing creation. I will say on a, on a brighter note, some of the things that we've done uh, will help us streamline. Uh, one of the laws that we just passed says to cities, if you are not meeting the requirements that we've all determined as a state, you need to be hitting as aspirations for housing goals. Housing built in certain categories, whether it be low income or workforce or market ready, would get streamlined. And, and that is really a set of incentives, uh, carrots and sticks to cities to say, if you're hitting targets, great, but if you're not, projects are going to move forward. And I think that's entirely appropriate, and that has been very controversial to what I just described. Um, there are also new voices in the legislative process who say, you know, not there are folks who are not in my backyard, but I'm yes in my backyard. I want things to move forward, and I think uh, those that it's a, it's a good perspective for us to hear, because uh, certainly a lot of these, these new activists who are, are young uh, are in the millennial generation, they realize if we don't build more housing, they will not be able to afford to live here. They will not be able to raise their children here. Uh, their parents know that uh, they could lose their kids to other states if we don't figure this out, and, uh, and that conversation is changing. But the, the last thing I'll say is the, the package of bills I just mentioned, um, it's a good down payment to move forward on things, but a down payment pays for 20% of the problem. Um, it took us decades to get to where we are today. It's going to take us years to get out. This is really a big start, but only a start to solve the problem. Yes, I agree. I mean, I mean, my only ask of our community is that we be more vocal. I feel like in many ways, our voices are not heard in San Francisco because we aren't vocal. There's a very loud vocal group 
if it's nimbyism, it's the vocal about nimbyism. If it's something else, it's vocal about something else. And I think we do ourselves a disservice um, by not um, helping a study, by basically just vocalizing how we feel, or what our thoughts are, or what we want our future to be. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, a vocal minority that I think often gets the attention, um, and on other issues as well. And I, I, mean, I think in the 2016 election, um, that happened too, where people just like, some people just out angered other people. And it's like housing, we all say we care about it, but we don't get up and go to the meetings, right? Immigration, like we care about it, but we're not loud about it. Um, and so I guess the, the question is like, how do you make people, how do you make it something that people care about enough to do that so that they, their voice, um, is heard over the people that are angry on the other side. I think in part it's about meetings and conversations like this and tech for campaigns and, and, and folks understanding that it's one thing to get up in the morning, go to your job at your company, come back. Uh, but if you want to see your community get better, if you want to have places to live that are not $4,500 a month, you don't want to be stuck on the 101 or the 280 in traffic uh, for three or four hours of the day. If you want to think about a school system where you may want to have kids someday, where you'll be proud of the schools that we're in, you got to get involved. And what I often find is a lot of tech and innovation workers, they're very, um, I think it's uh, almost a stretch to say they're focused not just on the quarter, but they're focused on what's going on that week, what's going on that month, and how are you going to hit that startup target. And that's important, but um, but I often hear a lot of complaints out of, uh, out of these communities, and I say, please, if you're going to complain, get involved and speak out and show up at the hearing and, and support policies that, that you care about. Yeah, I mean, that is literally why we created Tech for Campaigns, because I couldn't sit around anymore and just talk about it. Um, interesting. So let's, let's move to a little bit of a more macro conversation about um, I think tech and politics. Um, there's some disturbing statistics out there, and I'll quote for anyone who might not know them, but um, the average Senate race in 2016, um, Republicans outspent Democrats three to one on digital. Um, that's not something that just happened in, in 2016 and not just uh, the Senate. Uh, for every dollar you give to the average the average Democratic campaign, about a nickel to a dime is going to digital. Um, so one of the questions I have for you is, why, how, are, how are Democrats so far behind on just even prioritizing tech? How much do you answer, David? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm so, not competing. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I would say a, a number of things. Um, Republicans are often actually better funded I know your statistic were compared, I think compared apples to apples, but yeah. I'll just first make the point that uh, Republicans often have a lot more support from, uh, from corporate money and deep pockets that already start to create an unlevel playing field. Um, and Republican constituencies, I think, are often closer to those corporate interests that understand the role of tech. Uh, and I think Democrats, we rely on grassroots constituencies but don't think about how tech can apply to, uh, to, to mobilize more quickly, more efficiently, more effectively, and actually stretch those dollars. Um, uh, you know, while I, I, I campaign hard for Hillary Clinton, um, I think our side did a terrible job of thinking of how to use tech, and uh, we found out after the fact that Donald Trump and his team were, were having our lunch when it came to how they analyze data, how they were micro-targeting, um, how they use the latest and greatest of, 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 of technology tools to reach out. And, uh, and it just it goes to show, again, the reason for an organization like this to, to think about how the smartest minds can use the cutting edge technology uh, to, to insert ourselves into campaigns where we can make a difference. Uh, the company that I ran for almost 10 years was, sort of, was in this space, uh, thinking about how to better mobilize grassroots constituencies uh, online. Um, and yet there's just so much more we can do. We, we are getting out done and we have to focus on that in a real way. So question on that, David. Do you think that because 
So Trump campaign didn't have any traditional campaign managers, but had this like new wave of people um, who hadn't like traditionally been campaigning, um, campaign for him might have led to a higher adoption in tech. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think they needed to because I think they had fewer grassroots folks that could rely on, so they needed to rely on technology to, to get the word out. And, um, and we were spoiled by two Obama campaigns that did a really good job of mobilizing grassroots constituencies. And I think we, we took that for granted that somehow that was going to turn out again, and unfortunately, it certainly didn't happen in 2016 to poor fighters on. Is it also true that, um, and I don't know this, which is why it's a question, but campaign managers usually see kickback from television networks. I'm sorry, seek. Uh, campaign managers are incentivized by television networks. Right? So there is that as well. So oftentimes in campaigns, campaign consultants uh, get a percentage cut off of TV ads. It's the quickest way to make money. Uh, it's this weird incentive in political campaigns that uh, that push strategists to, to push candidates like us to go on TV. Uh, when we should be asking for the ROI of what it means to invest in tech. Um, but I remember from years ago working with a lot of campaigns and trying to get folks to spend a little bit more on technology. When you're in a campaign, you're trying to be very penny, you're, you're, you're paying on every penny uh, through the course of the campaign. And on the Democratic side, there aren't as many stories as we need of, of those positive outcomes of what happens when you invest in tech. So my hope is in 2018, in this fight for, say, Congress and being able to flip the House, if we have examples, maybe supported by folks in this room, of being able to win back some of those red seats and turn them blue, we can, we can continue to export the importance of relying on data and technology and online communications. Just, a, it's not campaign managers who get a percentage, but the digital consultants. Correct. Yeah. Correct. But yeah, it's a, it's a sort of a perverse incentive, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I would say Virginia is the first example. We had um, 35 projects in Virginia, and you know they took you know, 15 seats. So um, we're pretty excited about the early signs. The, the, the ironic thing about being penny wise is you're penny wise. You probably don't want to spend money on TV. You want to do digital and like be able to iterate and know if a message works first. So that's that's the irony of of the. The idea that we should just keep you know, doing what we're doing, and this is uh, we don't have that much money, especially I think at the state level where you know TV buys in like Virginia as an example, which can have a DC media spend or media market are out of control. So like if you're raising 250k for your state campaign in Virginia, and you have to spend you know 50k or 25k to get on TV, it's like that's crazy. Um, so. There is a bit of an irony in that, but here's a question I, I, I really hope both of you will answer this. Um, <clears throat> do you feel right now that Democrats as a, as a party, um, not a, an explicit candidate, but as a party, have a cohesive message that resonates with a, with a large swath of Americans? And what would you do to influence? <laughs> I could not. The science of was pretty indicative. As a Democratic leader here in San Francisco and as a Democratic legislator in California, um, I know what values we have stood for, but I don't think we've done a good job of getting our message out. And the fact of the matter is, I believe that our party and Democrats stand for the everyday person, the little guy. Uh, we stand for communities that have uh, not had the opportunities in the past. Uh, we stand for uh, economic opportunity and ensuring real freedom, real liberties, and tolerance of, of diversity. Um, but in 2016, we did a really poor job of, of communicating that, and we also did a poor job of, of, of speaking to folks who uh, understandably feel extremely economically insecure during this current transformation of our economy. And, uh, and that failure uh, was evident in 2016, and I think we're slowly working toward it, but we've got a lot more to go. And in California, though, you know, one thing I'll say about what we were trying to do in one of the resistance states is really lay out a set of policies and platforms that, that provide a counterbalance to, uh, to what we're seeing out of Washington and 
Trump land and, and red states. Uh, so whether it be fighting for housing, uh, fighting for free community college, uh, fighting for uh, for healthcare and single payer, fighting for immigrants, fighting for a woman's right to choose in the environment. These are all parts of the platform that uh, that that I think and hope uh, the country will understand. But we, again, we still have to think of how we message and how we communicate. If, um, as um, President Trump likes to call them, Nancy and Chuck called you tomorrow and said, "Hey, what's the one thing you would do differently on the messaging side?" Um, I think part of it is I think part of it is the style of communications in that we often rely on sort of data and factoids and we're not communicating with the stories and the anecdotes that um, that help to move folks. Um, I also think we have sorely lacked a real economic strategy or message and how we're going to address this economic uh, insecurity that um, that this region, Silicon Valley. And the Bay Area are blamed for it, whether it be automation, uh, whether it be uh, technology and innovation, um, artificial intelligence. Um, a lot of the country is, 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 is a little horrified and worried about what could happen out of this innovation. And we've got to do a better job of explaining that, as has always been the case with technological innovation, um, it can and will lift up all boats, but we have to do a better job of explaining. Um, so I was discussing this question with a friend of mine, and he uh, made a really um, interesting comment where he said, if you don't address the question of inequality or don't take it seriously enough, you either have a populist revolt or you have a fascist takeover. Um, oh, <laughs> I'm not I, I comment on that. Um, I, um, I, feel, I feel pretty strongly that the in addition to being anti-Trump, the Democratic Party needs to have an affirmative um, vision for what it means to be a Democrat in some sense. And I, and the, like some of the things that I hear are, are like you know, climate change is real. Um, like you know, we believe um, that we need to do things for it. But if you are in a place that has faced a drought and you're like you know, why are you like this is probably because of climate change. Like why are you voting? or the official or the party that stands for like, you know, dealing with climate change. It's just like, I cannot map that 100,000 foot message with my day-to-day -day reality. I'm, I cannot map why supporting um, a candidate who believes climate change is real is going to solve my doubt problem. Does it mean I'm going to have water tomorrow? Does it mean I'm going to get subsidies today? Um, like, there is no way for me to map um, those messages to my day-to-day -day reality. Um, when someone says that, you know, um, that there's a healthcare bill, and um, if you don't like that, you're going to lose your insurance, um, but the messages that you hear in that pain are like, you know, you have, you hear a patient who has cancer talking about how difficult it would be for them to get treatment um, if, like, we didn't do something about it. And, and again, in that particular scenario, like it's difficult for me to empathize with it because I don't have cancer. Um, I don't have any family members who do have cancer. In fact, if you look at like, I think cancer is a big deal and I think it's a terrible disease to have, but if you look at the percentage of the population that does have cancer, it's actually relatively small. Um, and in, in some sense, like how are you like translating that message to how it impacts people in their day-to-day -day lives? And and even though um, the, uh, Trump was like part of the people, he was talking to people about their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I think that's where the gap is. Um, I'm happy to say I'm a Democrat, but I feel like that is the gap and we need to bridge the gap. Agreed. I'm gonna actually stop for a second there and take a question or two from the audience before we end. Start back there, just because Shannon had our hand up. Um, I'm curious about, in a best case scenario, what a good working relationship looks like between tech companies that are creating cutting edge innovations and the governments, whether it's federal or local, who are trying to regulate it without stifling the innovation. I appreciate you that point earlier. If you come down too hard with the policy before you understand the nuance of what's happening. 
um, you can really do some unintended damage. So I'm curious, in a world where there is an intentional stonewalling by one side or the other, what would a good partnership look like to do? That's a great question, and one that we're grappling with with every couple of weeks with the latest disruptive uh, business model that we grapple with from a policy standpoint. And the fact of the matter is, anytime there's a, a new innovation, there's a possibility that it runs up against traditional governance models and, and challenges it. Um, and, and, and oftentimes, if it's an effective business model, you'll see consumer adoption. Um, but but say 20th century rules that are being upended by this. And the challenge for those of us who are policymakers is to figure out how do we protect the good without, uh, with, and, and, and deal with the bad and, and strike that balance. Because um, oftentimes business leaders would love nothing less than to have zero regulation on it, but that is not always the answer. So for example, uh, when Airbnb first came to San Francisco, slightly contentious topic. And we found that there were entire buildings that were being emptied to create year-round beds and breakfasts. Um, I proposed something that I thought balanced the interests on the one hand of allowing San Franciscans that are struggling to pay the rent, to make the mortgage, to be able to make a little bit of income if they're opening up their own homes. But on the other hand, not wanting to turn entire apartment buildings into their Beds of breakfast. And what, we, uh, what I ended up proposing was uh, putting a limitation to say everyone who used Airbnb or home sharing had to register. You had to pay your taxes, you had to abide by all these rules, and you couldn't um, let out your home for more than three months of the year. And uh, initially, the Airbnbs of the world were not thrilled with this set of regulations, but over time, your debate, I think, came to understand of the interests we're trying to balance. I would say the same applies to Uber Lyft on the streets of San Francisco. Um, you know that the cab system and Muni and other modes of transit weren't addressing the needs of our residents, and Lyft and Uber absolutely filled a niche. But today we have massive congestion, and we don't exactly know what's driving that congestion. Could it be there are an awful lot of Ubers and Lyfts? Maybe we need to have a conversation about what that looks like and how these new uh, business models intersect with the form and function of our, our city. And that's that's what all of these discussions are about. It's about uh, new ideas and impacting old regulatory structures and figuring out, recalibrating again, what is in the common good, what's in the best interest of our residents, and setting up a new set of rules that balance, maximize good, and, uh, and hopefully shut down that. Um, so, Richie, going off of the last, um, so, going, going on to the last point you made, where um, you know, in order to have a more cohesive message, we need um, a way to sort of relate to people um, in their day to day lives. Um, so, I'm a reporter, someone who tries to do that every single day, um, and obviously, I know it's not that easy to always relate to a general audience. Um, so, but when it, with immigration in particular, which I focus on a lot, um, you know, how do you, and in the beginning, you were saying um, it's important for immigrants or foreigners to share their stories, to, you know, relate, to, you know, show their um, place in the city and why they're so important to our country and blah, blah, blah. How do you get, um, and especially someone who's involved with Ford.us, how do you convince um, foreigners to share their stories when, at the end of the day, in this environment, they're actually afraid of their status? So how do you, like, convince people to come out, share their stories, and, Max Levchin has done a really good job of that. You know, he's mm -hmm. an immigrant to, to this country and right. I think he's taken a very vocal position, pro-immigration and, you know, pro, you know, and then the, um, the positive economic impacts of that. I think right. to some extent it's easier if you're a successful, you know, immigrant, mm -hmm. um, who has demonstrably created jobs, demonstrably created value. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, you also get a bigger podium to speak from in that instance than asking someone who is gonna risk their immigration status to speak out. Right, but those aren't the day-to-day -day people so that you were talking about. I mean, go ahead. So I guess it depends on what your goal is. Is right. your goal to, uh, convince people who are on the fence that immigration is good, in which case, you're there for me, right? Yeah. 
in which case strategies point stands, those that have a bigger podium, um, that have a compelling story, that mm -hmm. are articulated about the issue, should like step up the podium and like speak? Um, or is your point to give um, everybody who is an immigrant a platform to voice their concerns and express how they're feeling? Right. So I guess the question is, what is your goal? Right. I'm, I'm not saying my goal, I'm just saying Yeah, in general. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the question that I would ask. Right. Like, I guess like, what is the goal? What is the end that you're trying to get to? Mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, it's a question of like, how can you get there in the most effective and efficient way? Right. Um, so again, if if it is to um, if it is to basically change um, opinion for people who are on the fence, or to basically um, come out and like talk about how some of these fears are, um, are unsupported by evidence, then I think you can have a lot of people come up to the podium with like positive stories who aren't at risk. Um, of like the immigration status. Um, Dara Kazrashah, who's another example, yeah. who's, who's really yeah. spoken up about this issue um, even before he was in Uber when he was expedient yeah. and as a Muslim immigrant yeah. to America, you know, he's a person that people can say, okay, well, it seems like he's actually been pretty net positive mm -hmm. to, to American society. Yeah, and, and I mean, and there are, have been people who have been at risk in terms of their immigration status, but uh, have been actually pretty well known. Like there was a New York Times reporter that came out to talk about his story, um, and that made a big difference. Um, so I, I think it's just a question of like being effective um, in some sense. I, I would answer the question in a slightly different way. And since you're a journalist, you know that it's far more effective to start a story by saying, uh, you know, Miguel Chu had this experience than 52% of immigrants. Da, 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 da. Um, I certainly know why I'm promoting bills, and I've authored some of the big immigration bills this year in California, that we always have to find faces to, to attach because, you know, the reason the Kate Steinle example is used by Donald Trump and his allies is it's so easy to put a face to a young woman struck down in the middle of her life than it is for the millions of law-abiding immigrants regardless of immigration status, living in cities where sanctuary cities have actually been shown with data to keep them safe. And so it is all about how do you find immigration those voices. Um, a couple of bills that we had this year to help uh, immigrant workers uh, have more protections in their workplaces if ICE decides to raid them or to provide protections to immigrant tenants if they have landlords that want to support them uh, to Donald Trump. Um, we literally have to spend a lot of time to find these voices, but it's important for us um, on the side of light and good, I think, to, to surround these brave and courageous voices um, with the support that they need. And, and I will tell you, I have a connection with literally the folks that have stepped up and spoken in support of my bills. If anything would ever happen to them, I would be first in line. Um, fighting with ICE on every, anything that 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 would happen, we have to we have to step up as a community. And I think um, what we're seeing right now with the Me Too movement is uh, is an amazing, uh, powerful moment where where everyday women who have been sexually harassed in every industry in the country have found support through each other, but also from society and communities who believe them. And, and I think we need to do this in every area, whether it be immigration rights or being able to speak articulately about the impacts of, of bad environmental decisions on the, the asthma rates of low-income communities of color in certain parts of the state and so on and so on and so on. But we have to find those voices. We have to support those voices with the power that we do have as communities. And we have to, to lift them up and protect them. And that's, that's how change happens. I, I think the need to campaign is a really powerful example. Mm -hmm. It started off by, you know, by certain really powerful or well-known celebrities coming forward with their stories. Um, and then it got momentum where everyone felt empowered to share without, have, without like, and basically like whether negative repercussions of sharing weren't as high as it would have been in the past. So I, I think it's similar. You get a lot of people to be the face of the campaign and then um, people will feel empowered to speak up. Um, I just wanted to, since we're on the topic of immigration, I do want to make a plug, which is everyone should call their elected officials to um, support the Green Act, um, because this is the one time that everyone needs to act in a bipartisan fashion. Um, this is on December 22nd. 
So. Yeah. Um, the budget is going to be like to be voted on. It's to be voted on. Yeah. So this is a good time to call your elected officials and actually do something and speak up. So I'm gonna add just one more question. Sorry. Um, well, well, some time to maybe at the end. But my one last question for you guys is: If you could give your 21 year old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Ooh, um, <laughs> as a father of a two-year-old, I think about this all the time. You know, I have to admit that uh, today, with the news and air media, you know, I think a lot about how short life is and how important it is for all of us to live every day as if it's our last. And that means a lot of different things to a lot of different folks, but, but taking uh, taking advantage of the moment and, and meeting it and you wonder if you should or you shouldn't, but just deciding you're going to make a difference uh, at every moment because you don't know how much you have. That's pretty special. Um, when, um, I, I would tell my 21 year old self many, many things, <laughs> but I'm going to put it in context for the conversation that we've just had. Um, one of the reasons um, that I feel um, people working in tech don't speak up or don't participate is because it is a younger demographic. Um, they haven't seen or experienced a lot of the issues um, that you do once you decide the city is going to be a home and you're going to buy a house and you're going to raise a family and um, and so on and, and you're going to send your kids to school and so on and so forth. Um, so if I, if I was showing my 21 year old self, I would say act and activate um, because you want to be deciding what you want to be deciding on the policies that govern the city that you will be living in and that will be impacting your life for the long run. Um, don't wait till the problem hits you. Okay. Right. Well, thank you guys to Ruchi and David and everyone here. Um, and everyone that tuned in online, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for being so open. And um, we'll uh, hope to be uh, involved with you guys in the future. And thanks everyone for coming. Um, we'll take a little time at the end. Uh, um, thank you all for the outside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.